Today we begin two classes, <clears throat> the last two classes, on remedies. Um, remedies to institutional corruption. Uh, so if we th we've been thinking about institutional corruption with this metaphor, the compass and the magnet creating an influence um, that undermines the effectiveness of this institution called the compass by producing magnetic deviation from the direction the compass otherwise would be pointing. Then the topic of today and on Thursday is to think about the interventions that might remedy the deviation by restoring the compass to the direction that it ought to be pointing. And so the question is how we might do that, and we're going to think through a series of these remedies uh, today. So the first of them is going to be the remedy of disclosure. Um, so there is a magnet that's disclosed. Now that you've disclosed that there is a magnet, uh, what's the likelihood of the effectiveness of that disclosure undermining the corrupting influence that you've identified through the techniques of institutional corruption. Well, the idea, the intu intuition was, for most of the history of thinking about conflicts of interest, the intuition was it was enough to disclose. Disclosure would give people all the information they needed to be able to respond to an improper influence in the way that one ought to respond by discounting the recommendation for example, of the person who is disclosed to have some kind of conflict. So this was a technique thought to be completely effective. But after you saw Mazarin Banaji's intervention, what's your guess of the effect about the effectiveness of disclosure as a remedy here? Anybody? Yeah. Doesn't do it because why? What's the dynamic here? So one question might be whether you've effectively disclosed it. That's absolutely true. But we, we, had, we had you in, the, in this course look at these readings, which was summarizing this fantastic symposium, which is really one of the best that there was on this issue. And it shows a dynamic beyond even the fact of the failure for everybody to actually recognize what was disclosed. So does disclosure work? Disclosure is the most common response to the pre presence of COIs, conflict of interests. For example, AMA's Code of Medical Ethics requires when physicians refer a patient to a facility in which they have ownership or when they recommend a patient for a clinical trial that they will benefit them financially, they disclose these facts. However, those this theoretical level, this theoretically levels the playing field. In fact, it does not really eliminate the problem, may make it worse. May make it worse uh, because, number one, it gives the advisor moral license. So the advisor, the person who's disclosed, says, OK, I've done the good thing. I've disclosed. And all information is on the table. So now I can act however I want. It's the other person's problem to figure out how to respond now to this information. So that licenses the advisor in a way that uh, he or she wouldn't have been licensed prior to the disclosure. And then from the advisee, the person receiving uh, disclosure's uh, perspective, it also has a perverse effect. Um, number one, it could signal, geez, that's a very honest doctor who's told me about this conflict. Now I should really trust that doctor. Or now that he's told me about the conflict, but thinks that I ought to, that he still ought to be advising me, for me to say that he should not be advising me would be to insult him. So now I'm not going to act on the disclosure. Um, and so as they say, ideally they should lead to taking, uh, taking advice with a grain of salt, but in fact this seldom occurs. So here's a classic example of an intervention that has an unintended consequence. The intent of the intervention, the disclosure, was to put people in a better position to react to the potential of conflicts of interest. The reality is it doesn't put them in a better position. In fact, it could make them worse. Um, this, this paper goes on to describe modeling this, and this is a pretty dramatic way of characterizing um, 
the way that playoffs in these kind of disclosure games work. So the gap between the yellow and the orange line measures the loser is the yellow, the orange is the winner here. So the advisor is winning the most in the context of high disclosure. So disclosure turns out to be a technique for the rich to get ridder, richer or ridder. Don't know what that would mean, but anyway, ritter, richer, whatever the rich you want, that's, this is a technique for producing it because it's in fact inducing people to behave in a, wor in a way that's worse than they would have otherwise would have behaved had there not been that kind of disclosure. So it's hard to embrace the idea of disclosure as a sufficient solution to the problem of institutional corruption. As Lowenstein puts it, conflicts of interest will bias physicians, however well-intentioned, Bias will distort their choices, or if they or may, may look for and unconsciously emphasize data that supports their personal interests. The only viable response, according to Lowenstein, is to eliminate the conflicts of interest. Eliminate gifts from pharmaceutical companies to physicians. That should include gifts of any size, because even small gifts can lead to unconscious bias. And it's not just in the context of um, medical uh, research that we'll see this dynamic. We're going to see this dynamic when we get at the end of the class today to um, thinking back about the way Congress functions or doesn't function. But the point is this remedy says rather than disclosure as the solution, eliminate the interest, the conflict as the solution. So disclosure here is offered not as a, um, not as a remedy. Okay. Anyone, does if anybody want to defend disclosure? No? We can discard it, throw it away. There it is, gone. Okay, ratings. Um, we had this uh, this little essay by Jennifer Miller, who was the person I debated about the pharmaceutical industry. She defended. She was taking the role of defending the pharmaceutical industry. Um, what is the idea she has here for ratings? How would ratings work as a way to deal with the problem of institutional corruption? This is me aspiring to have an interactive class. It's fun. <laughs> Are you aspiring with me? We could do this together. <laughs> no? I could just think about the end. Oh, they're great. Yeah. Okay, so you have someone that says, this is good pharma, that's bad pharma. And the assumption is that those bits of data out there in the world will create an incentive for pharma to become good pharma rather than bar bad pharma. What does that assumption depend on? What do you have to believe about the world for that assumption to work? Okay, so first you've got to believe in the ratings. But let's say we have gold standard ratings. We have no doubt about that. What's the second thing we have to work with? Yeah. And care about them, right. They'll look at them and care about them. So what's the reason why you would think consumers would, that, that, what, what's the reason why she thinks that consumers might actually care about ratings like this, or at least companies would believe that consumers would care here? They have a stake, that's right. And, and to the extent you've got these companies, this is a kind of unintended consequence of big multi conglomerate corporations in pharmaceutical industries, to the extent that they have lots of products, um, a bad rating with respect to one could potentially bleed over into the, cons the consumer's interest in their product generally. So if you're Johnson & Johnson and you get badly rated for something you're doing with respect to one product, that's really costly because consumers are not going to finally distinguish between your bad rating on one drug and your behavior with, uh, with respect to everything else. So this is to say the rating might actually have uh, a more impact, more, be more impactful than is rational, just because nobody has time to actually figure it out. So that's one way to think that it could work. There's also activist organizations, she, say, she says, who could deploy their um, uh, tools to try to make ratings um, felt firmly by the, uh, by the agency, by the company, so that the company would respond to them. 
She says that companies that are mid-sized that are trying to be acquired by larger companies would be in a better merger position if they had high ratings associated with their drugs or their behavior so that um, it would make it more profitable for them to be acquired. Um, she says that employees don't want to work in a context where they feel like they're working for the devil often or always. Um, I know a lot of you think you're going to go out and make all your money on Wall Street in a week and then retire for the rest of your life. So I understand temporary deviledom, but, um, but most people don't want to live or commit themselves to living with the devil. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the fact that you've got a badly rated company will make it harder for them to attract the right kind of employees. Um, and, and these are all the ways in which she suggests that you could create a rating system that would have the leverage effect necessary to push companies towards behaving in a way more consistent with the ideals of the labeler. But let's get back to the idea of the problem with the labeler. What might be, what do you have to think about or worry about in the context of setting up the institution to label? That they would have conflicts of interest. They could have conflicts, right. They might, the people that they're, the companies that they're rating are interested in. So we've seen that before in this class, right? Where did we see that? Right, the rating agencies for the financial instruments adopted a business model where they were being paid by the people who's ra who were acquiring the ratings. And that create, created the incentive, or the suggestion was that created an incentive for them to compromise their ratings. So it becomes very important in the context of ratings then to figure out how you're going to avoid capture of the rating agency. There's an incentive for the companies being affected by the ratings to create this capture. And there's not a lot of opportunities for a rating agency to get funded independent of the people who are interested in capturing that rating agency. So there's no simple way, unless the government were to fund it, to guarantee that you wouldn't have that sort of capture, which makes it hard to get this thing going if indeed it's a good idea to get going. Um, okay. That's ratings. Ideas, any more ideas on ratings? Anything I wants to say about this before we move to next? Next, great, next. <clears throat> defense. OK, so by defense, what I mean is techniques that you may adopt to protect yourself from being influenced by the evil magnet, you know thicker shielding around the, well, that doesn't really work because it needs to be subject to, okay, but you get the idea. So interventions that make it so you're not so susceptible to these kinds of um, uh, uh, influences. And one of them, one traditionally, um, is the idea of professionalism. So you have certain fields that are thought of as professions, and I don't mean profession in the sense that they call themselves a professional window installer. That's not what I mean. I mean a profession in the sense that accounting is a profession, or the law is a profession, or physicians are part of a profession. And when you call yourself a profession in that sense, what it means is you've gotten together and articulated a set of values that you think you should aspire to practice. And those values are independent of the direct interest of any particular client you might have. So in the context of the law, the legal profession thinks that the objective of the lawyer is to advance the law while helping clients. And if there's a conflict, that creates a very uh, complicated set of rulings that work out how to be a good lawyer in the context of your conflicted interest with the client, but there are all sorts of implication, there are all sorts of actual rules about what you can do even though it's against the interest of your client because you're trying to seek the interest of protecting the profession. So profession is a device that gets created to produce the right kind of incentives in the professionals to act in the interest of the public. The profession thinks it's advancing the interest of the public rather than the interest of just the clients. That's one kind of defense. So a good lawyer doesn't do this, a good doctor doesn't do that. Those are ways to say, I will avoid the improper influence of the magnet. Okay, but let's think about that in a particular context. So has anybody gone to med school here? 
No, anybody sat in a med class, med medical school class before? So medical school, oh, you're pointing at somebody who? You haven't. <laughs> He's not who you think he is. <laughs> it's been a lie from the very beginning. <laughs> Okay, um, so the Harvard Medical School, Medical School in the last couple of years has gone through this really interesting radical transformation caused by some uppity first year med students who um, were angry because they got this lecture from a doctor, um, I don't mean, you know, he wasn't a doctor, but I'm, <laughs> um, they got this lecture from a doctor and then subsequently learned that the doctor had a financial interest in the treatment the doctor was lecturing about. And they said, uh, this is bad. You know, we should not be lectured by people who are going to make money if they convince us to pursue, pursue one strategy rather than another. We should at least be able to know what the interest of the doctor is as the doctor goes out there and lectures to us. So they embraced the first and flawed strategy that we identified above, which was disclosure. So now if you go to a medical school lecture or class, the first slide of every lecture is a list of all your conflicts. Here's all the conflicts I have. So I've taken money from Pfizer, I've taken money from so-and-so, I've taken money from so-and-so and so-and-so. So you get that slide out there, here's all my conflicts, and then that slide goes away, and then you go on and you lecture. All right. Now, it was intended to be a great, brilliant solution to avoid the conflicts and to protect poor medical students from being influenced by people who are actually just trying to make money. But what might the unintended consequences of that strategy be? They're good guys. Yeah. Okay, that's one important effect. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> how do I do that? Right. Um, more. What are other? I. Yep. Yeah. Right. So um, uh, this is a common. Uh, reflection on the way Harvard Medical School has changed. Um, um, it used to be that you as a medical school professor would never have any association with, for example, a drug company. That would be beneath you as a Harvard Medical School professor. Now, if you don't have an association with a drug company, it's kind of demeaning. It says you're not good enough to have an association with a drug company. All the cool guys have the association with the drug companies, right? So this is the way to show yourself as a really highly sought expert to have all these kinds of associations which creates the own, your own kind of perverse effect, which is you're increasing the number of conflicts as a consequence of producing that. Um, and, and related to that, you know, before you started showing those slides, med students would think to them, probably not even think about it, probably not think to themselves, geez, these professors are being paid by all sorts of other people, not think to be a great Harvard Medical School professor, I need to be paid by a whole bunch of other people. So they'd have this much purer idea. But now they're seeing how everybody's being paid by everybody, so they're being acculturated into the norm of practicing your work while being paid by everybody. Right? They're being taught that this is the ordinary way in which people behave. Um, uh, and so what, rather than creating an even stronger separation between the academic and the proprietary, it might be inducing, unintended consequence, might be inducing a tighter connection between the academic and the proprietary. Um, um, so, uh, okay, any other, any other thoughts about how med school today might be functioning not the way anybody planned it to be? Okay, now one advance over this, or one related development with this, is to insist on purifying the med school environment in the sense that, I mean, you know, obviously they wash their hands, but, um, but in the sense that they 
avoid all possible conflicts. So no pizzas from drug companies, no pens from drug no gifts, none of that junk. So that you teach kids in an absolutely pure and sterile environment how to become doctors. And then when they step out into the world, they'll be in a position to better protect themselves from all the um, efforts by pharmaceutical companies to pervert them or distort their judgments and things like that. What, what do you think about that as the strategy? Brilliant. How many people have read this book? Which you should have. It's a short story. Anybody read this book? Short story? There was a movie. You could have seen the movie. Yeah. Did you, so what's this about? Man comes into town, and it's been a long time since high school when I read it. But he uh, sort of starts selling things to people, <coughs> offering them all sorts of different things. And it turns the town, this like very quaint, like beautiful, peaceful town, sort of against each other. And all right, but the rel right. So that's that's one at one level of generality, perfectly true description. But the direct connection here is. Hadleyburg is a town filled with perfectly moral people, people who have never, ever confronted moral di morally difficult choices, because nobody ever tries to cheat in Hadleyburg, ever. And then this guy comes in, and he offers all of these people an incredible amount of money for cheating in a small way. And everybody in Hadleyburg cheats. And the basic moral of the story is, if you've never had the experience of actually being confronted with morally difficult choices and having to make a morally difficult decision, you will have no muscle developed in you for making morally difficult decisions in the right way. So exactly, I'm sorry, your name in the corner is? Doug. Doug. Exactly in Doug's point with respect to med school, the Hadleyburg analogy would be, if you raise kids in med school never having to confront the difficult decision about how to make a judgment about whether to listen to a drug company rep or not, they will be even more vulnerable to the drug company rep when they get out of med school than they, were, than they would be if they actually grew up learning how to deal with this kind of conflict. So, so the unintended consequence here of defense as in creating a perfectly pristine, pure environment is that you're not, you haven't developed the immunities you need in order to go out in the world and confront the real viruses and the likes that are out there. Okay, so, so that strategy might be a bad strategy, which has led some people to think about this as an alternative strategy. Um, a class to immunize med students against improper influence by trying to influence them improperly in the class. <laughs> so, you know, in the same way in which you kind of say to kids, we're going to expose you to lots of germs so that you develop the right kind of immunities, um, you think about a, rig a kind of rigorous education that puts kids through the experience of being exposed in a certain way to certain kinds of judgment calls and moral temptations and, and the like to force them into a practice of learning how to think strategically um, or at least reflectively about the kind of influences that are being presented so that they can develop the experience and the practice to learn how to resist those types of experiences. Um, so that in a sense what you're saying is we recognize there's no way to purify the world so if we can't purify the world, we will accept the world as the corrupt place it is. All we can do then is just to help people resist that kind of corruption. And the way we can do that is to give them the experience in a you know, classroom environment. No great souls will be lost. Um, uh, but to give them that kind of experience so that they then leave thinking they know when they see an influence coming exactly how to identify it, mark it, and move on from it. So that would be a, that's a different kind of defense. It's not a defense in the sense of, I'm going to um, make sure that there is no threat. It's instead a defense that says, I'm going to accept that there is a, a threat, but then build up the resistance, a proper kind of resistance to step up and, and, and push back against it. 
But if you want to give me that, that's fine. <laughs> totally OK. Um, yeah, no, it's hard to figure out how you'd structure it to be realistic in the gross sense. But the point that I think that you can see from the readings that we've had is that this, the influence we're really worried about trying to control for is the middling or lower kind of influences, right? Um, and, um, you know, because the I'll give you a million dollars if you do X, um, for most people is just irresistible, of course. Whatever the, whatever the X is for whatever the right price is, I'll do it. And that, so you can't really solve for that problem. The kind of problem you're kind of trying to solve for is the kind of ongoing intermediate um, corruption that might come from the wrong kind of influence steering you in a way that you're not being sufficiently reflective about. Um, uh, and this project is not yet convinced that it's possible to be sufficiently reflective about it. Remember Mazarin Banaji's work about the um, uh, IAT, the implicit attitude test, that was used to demonstrate people having implicitly racist attitudes or implicitly sexist attitudes or whatever. Um, and one hope from that research originally was that if we could just tell people that they've got this, then they can react. They can compensate. But the conclusion from the research is that, in fact, you can't. You can't compensate. It's not going to help you. It's not going to actually make it so you can. Now, it might help people to know you're a certain kind of person, so we're going to put you in the structure where there are ways to verify that the decisions you make are not being affected by these attitudes. So there might be something to do outside of you. But psychologically, there's not much we can do with you. Um, um, so this project of sort of building the immunities within the community is not convinced it can work, but that's a strategy that's different from the strategy of saying, let's just create the pristine environment and, and that will build up the moral souls that we need to go out and face the real world. Okay, that's defense. So um, these three strategies um, are relatively contestable. They're not great. Um, they're all deployed in some to some degree or not, but I'm not excited really about any of them. The one that I am very excited about that I want you to think about as a category and think about it for the rest of your life and everything you do, okay, well sometimes think about it again after you leave this class, is the blinding. Blinding as a remedy. So this was the um, uh, work we gave you, um, blinding as a solution to institutional corruption. Um, and Chris had set up institutional corruption problem um, a little bit differently from how I had modeled it. He says, what we've got here is a funder funding a decision maker. And that funder funding a decision maker creates a certain dependency. So this could be a pharmaceutical company funding a researcher. Um, it could be a lawyer funding an expert witness in a trial. Um, but that's a dependency. And the fear is that that dependency produces bias in the decision maker's work. Um, and that bias produces an outcome that then gives satisfaction to the funder. So this is the mechanism of institutional corruption as um, Chris Robertson was describing it. And one solution to that problem is the same solution that was described by Lowenstein in the context of um, disclosure, which is basically destroy the dependency make it so there isn't funding. Um, so if there's no funding, then you don't have to worry about bias. But of course, that's not really an adequate solution because for many things, if there isn't funding, it doesn't happen. So we can't say just deal with this by getting rid of funding. We have to figure out how with funding to deal with this kind of bias. Chris talks about professionalism as a response. We've talked about that already. He's talked about disclosure as a response. We've talked about that already. So then he adds a new opportunity, new response, which is what he calls blinding. Um, and so blinding is the process of removing information from the exchange in a way designed to neutralize the corrupting influence of that information. So it's, it's, it's in the class of have your cake and eat it too solutions in the sense that it wants there to be funding, but it doesn't want to produce the corrupting influence of, of funding. Um, and he uh, powerfully pulls together the uh, analysis in this single chart that I want to spend a couple minutes working through. Um, 
So there are, th there are three kinds of dynamics here. The subsidy dynamic, which is produced by um, the uh, money that's being given. Um, so subsidy, de uh, the definition here, a funder provides financial support for a decision maker. That produces a subsidy. There's a selection dynamic. The funder chooses which potential decision maker receives the subsidy. And if you're in a, cont uh, uh, and so that's, that's a particular dynamic that comes with funders having that power. And identification, funder has this special opportunity to influence the decisions. Okay, so the, that's the definition of the elements to this problem. The potential biasing mechanism that each of them present. With the subsidy, the goods and service are produced that might not otherwise be produced. So if I subsidize the production of malaria drugs in a market where the people who need malaria drugs are not likely to be able to afford it, that subsidy will increase the production of malaria drugs, and that, you could think, is a good thing. Or in the law school context, um, the Olin Foundation was a right-wing foundation that spent an extraordinary amount of money to induce law professors to study law and economics because they believed if people studied law and economics, it would tilt the law in a further, further to the right. Probably did have that effect in many contexts, but that was a subsidy function to produce a kind of attitude within legal, the legal academy that otherwise they didn't think was being sufficiently produced. Okay. Um, selection bias here, the decision makers disproportionately reflect the funders' preferences. So um, the bias of the selection, because I'm subsidizing, if I have a selection ability, then I will pick people who benefit my preferences, um, independent of the merits, perhaps, or in the context of where merits are close to tied in a way that signals how people should show themselves to the funder so that if you want to get funding, you need to seem conservative. If you want to seem fun get funding, you have to seem like you're um, sensitive to certain kinds of issues. That's a bias in the, in the process that relative to how it would otherwise be if we didn't have this kind of selection biasing going on. And then identification, the decision maker internalizes the preference of the funder as the funder. So um, I know what my funder cares about. And since I know what my funder cares about, and I know I want to keep my funder happy, then as the decision maker, I do things that I know will keep the funder happy, even if those things aren't necessarily the best thing for the project that I would be otherwise advancing. Um, OK, so those are the problems created. Then here's the blinding solution. Um, in the context of the subsidy bias, create an alternative source of funding, or you lose the subsidized goods and services. All right, so that's a nice aspiration, but often not feasible here. So if you want to keep the subsidy, uh, but you want to minimize the selection or identification bias, then here are te the techniques you could deploy there. You could uh, have an intermediary perform the alternative selection. So rather than giving the selection to somebody who might be affected by the funder bias, give it to somebody who wouldn't be affected by the funder bias, then the selection is not going to be tainted like that. Um, and with the identification, give the decision maker is unable to distinguish funders from non-funders. Make sure the decision maker can't internalize the funder's bias because the decision maker doesn't know who the funder is or doesn't know how the funder relates to the certain project. Um, so you've shut off that information from the decision maker and therefore you've avoided the bias. Each of these, Chris says, creates certain risks. Um, so if you eliminated the subsidy bias by not taking the funds or getting some alternative, then you risk not producing something it's necessary to produce. The alternatives may be unavailable. Participatory funding may be important to institutional values. If you eliminate the selection bias by having uh, some other intermediary perform the selection who isn't affected by the funder, that uh, funder might not have a sufficient incentive to contribute. Um, might be that the funder actually has more experience in making these selections. And then finally, it may be that the intermediary is also a sham intermediary, not really someone in a better position to make the judgment. And if you eliminate the identification bias by making it so the decision maker can't tell who the funders, fund, uh, 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 distinguish funders from non-funders, 
then the information about the source of funding may be inextricable from the necessary information. You can't separate it out. Identification may be important to institutional values. Um, okay, so this is a map of the ideas and the trade-offs. But um, let me, I'm going to get clarification. Everybody understands this map because we're going to apply it to two problems. And I want you to uh, think about how we can get a blinding solution to these two problems. But is this, are there any questions about how this has laid itself out? Yeah, so the idea that's, um, so the idea, so, so think about a university that has uh, alumni funders and is trying to advance the idea of the people within the university helping the university. Um, there, there's identification is important to the values of the university. Um, and so if you eliminated funder identification in that context, you weaken that uh, value. Um, so you have to trade off weakening that value with the gain that you might get, but it might be you're not getting enough of a gain to make it worthwhile. So it's just a possible way in which this could be undermined. All right, other questions about this? All right, so here's some examples. Um, so here's the problem. Lawyers, okay, don't have to say anything more. Just lawyers, that's it, that's the problem. Um, <laughs> lawyers, <laughs> lawyers, um, litigate complex cases. When they litigate complex cases, they have to hire experts. You've never probably been in the context of being hired as an expert or hiring an expert, but what can you tell me, what can you predict happens in the world where lawyers hire experts? Right, so you've got a world of defense experts and a world of plaintiff experts. And if you're going to be hired as a defense expert, you better damn sure you've never been on the plaintiff side and vice versa. So what's the problem with that? Why should we care about that? People are getting what they're wanting, getting what they're paying for. Yeah? Uh, these experts are supposed to kind of offer opinions out regard to who's hiring them. Right, they're supposed to be helping a fact finder, typically a jury, figure out what the facts are. And if you've got both sides just trying to figure out how strongly they can shade the truth to their own position, then the role of an expert um, is not much different from the role of an advocate. Um, so it's weakening the value of the experts. Um, um, OK, so where is the bias coming from? What's producing the bias? Yeah? OK, so the. Expert themselves wants to make sure that they will be hired in the future. And they want to signal their bias to people who might hire them in the future. So in a world where you can be hired by defense or by plaintiffs, the way to signal is to be consistent in one direction or the other. Um, how could you fix that through blinding? What would a blinding intervention be that might fix that? Okay, in the context of a trial, there's a pretty obvious independent partner, uh, par party. Well, the jury is not good at hiring people. <laughs> so who? It's nice. It's good. Yeah, the judge. The judge is the perfect person. And in fact, in Europe, this is the standard way in which experts are selected for cases. The judge makes the choice of the expert. Now the, now the expert is trying to signal to a different party the strength of the expert. And to signal to the judge the strength of the expert is not to signal you always come down on the plaintiff side or you always come down on the defendant side. Now your bias as an expert is to signal you're not biased as an expert. Um, and so by blinding um, the requesting party, you don't give the expert the opportunity, whether explicitly, self-consciously, or implicitly, to tilt his or her testimony in one way or the other. So blinding here has the function, has a plays a nice role 
in making it possible for you to hire experts um, who are not trying to please one side or please the other side. Now, why would you as a lawyer ever agree to such a system? Because in the United States, to a, it's not mandatory the judge hires the expert. It's only if the parties agree would the judge engage in this practice to hire the expert. So if you're a lawyer and you know, I can either hire my expert or I can turn it over to the judge to hire an expert, why would you ever decide to turn it over to the judge to hire an expert? What would you gain by that? Yeah? Okay, so one thing is you might feel good about yourself. Okay, but what could you tell your partner? Which is not going to be, I feel good about myself. Is there a self-interested reason why this might make sense? Not just a professionalism reason. Or you get rid of the appearance of bias? You get a, right. So if you had reason to believe that a jury would credit the independent expert much more significantly than the jury would credit the non-independent expert, um, and you believe is a good reason for the jury to credit the expert for your side to win, then you would have a pretty strong reason to want the independent expert, even though you couldn't get the expert, you couldn't sort of bias the expert in the way you want the expert to be biased. Yeah. Although, then, doesn't that immediately follow that the, your opposing counsel feels the opposite and is going to have the opposite motive to you? In, it depend, right, it could. So this is why it's not going to be possible in every case. But it could be that in certain cases where both parties really just want the expert to act as an expert, that giving up the ability to signal bias benefits both parties because both parties will have an expert who's going to be better able to um, um, offer the, uh, the evidence. And the other part about this is sometimes the party is, you know, so in, in a case, the, it's not the case that both sides always need to call an expert. So what you're saying is in the context where I'm calling an expert, do I as the plaintiff practice my right to call, to identify the expert myself, or do I ask the judge to identify the expert? And I can ask the judge to identify the expert whether the defense, the other side, agrees to that or not, because it's just my delegating that decision to the judge, and the judge is able to exercise that decision. So even where what you're talking about is true, there's still, be, there's still ways for somebody to take advantage of this independent expert. Um, um, and so one of the things that Chris Robertson has been doing is running these massive empirical studies to demonstrate the juries so much more value independent experts over partisan experts that it almost never pays to hire partisan experts, that you're wasting your client's money to hire partisan experts because people just discount what they're saying and it totally loses the value of an expert to being an expert. And that's related to um, research we had mentioned earlier where drug companies, the argument here uh, was that drug companies were wasting their money by directly funding drug research. And the argument here was we, uh, research was done to have um, doctors read summaries of drug research. And those summaries characterized the strength of the test. Was it a double-blind test? Was it anecdotal? Was there nothing said about how strong the test was? And it also characterized how the uh, research was funded. Was it funded by a pharmaceutical company? Was it funded by the NIH? Or was there nothing said about funding? And what this research found is that regardless of how strong the research technique was, double blinds, um, uh, randomly, uh, randomized control uh, um, uh, treatment or not, uh, physicians discounted the research if it was pharmaceutically funded. So they thought that the research was more likely to be biased or wrong because it was pharmaceutically funded, and they were less likely to actually have any conf uh, uh, less likely to take up the drug and to use the drug. So if you're a pharmaceutical company, it's the same argument that is being made to the expert witness. You would say, uh, the lawyers in the expert witness case, you'd be saying, it would be better for you to be funding this independently because if you funded it independently, the truths or the facts that it produced would more likely affect doctors to use your drug than they will be affected if they know that you funded it directly. So better to give your money to a foundation that will fund this kind of research rather than to fund it yourself. And here the expert witness claim is better to give 
um, the, the money effectively to the, the lawyer to fund, to identify the um, uh, expert witness, then to do it yourself. That's the testing drugs example that I wanted to talk about here. Okay. So here again, in the blinding uh, uh, for testing drugs, how might we think about blinding in the context of testing drugs? So what happens right now is you've got a um, drug company that comes up with a drug they think needs to go out to the market. Um, they then have to run it through a randomized control trial um, where um, there's um, very extensive testing to make sure the drug is safe and effective. Um, a lot of these companies basically run these trials themselves. They hire universities or they hire drug companies, I mean um, testing companies to test their drug. And given what I just told you about the way in which doctors might respond to that information, how could they use blinding as an alternative to this type of testing? What, what would the technique be? What would you do? Okay, so you could, right, so you could have an entity, let's call it the drug testing um, uh, agency, the DTA, that drug companies would um, send money to um, for a particular test, and then the DTA would hire the companies um, that would test it, and these companies would be worried just about whether they kept the DTA happy they would not be worried about whether they kept Pfizer happy or Merck happy. And so this money would go in here to produce these testing results, um, and the testing results would then have the, uh, uh, a flavor of independence that would give them more credibility because the actual funder has been blinded from the, um, the company that's actually going to be doing the testing. Okay, so that's one technique. What would the, what's, What's the reason why people, why isn't that happening now? What's, why isn't this universally what's done? Yeah. Surely the point is understanding why pharmaceutical companies are paying for these drugs and paying money for these drugs to buy those drugs. And if they, under this kind of system, if they were to report to you and say, this might not make sense for a drug, would you power to stop that drug? There's no incentive for pharmaceutical companies to pay in the sort of entity that you feel is just being constantly being constantly powerful. Right. So they lose control. So the cost is the loss of control over bad information, um, certainly, but they also might lose control in a, in a less um, malign sense of that word. Yeah. Okay, so one problem might be cross-subsidy, but you know, let's, wor let's bracket the cross-subsidy for a second. I want to focus on this control issue. What else might you be worrying about you can't control? All right, so, so information which, again, weakens the brand, the reputation of the brand. Okay, that's one. So that, that's in the category of information you'd rather other people not know. But there's another kind of control here that you also give up if your DTA is running it, right? What, what is that? Yeah. So lots about the design and lots about monitoring the implementation of the design. So if you're the best possible company, um, and you really want drugs to be tested in an effective way, and you hire these companies to test it in this effective way, you have an interest to go out there and make sure they're testing it in the right way. You, know, you don't have to be interested in them biasing it. Even you, you could just be interested in them doing their job well. And now you've got to rely on the DTA to do it. The DTA has got to be the agency that's making sure everybody's doing it well. So that's another cost. You're giving up the cost of efficiency, control in the sense of the efficiency of the testing. Um, and so you'd only be willing to do that if the benefit of this would be higher than those costs. And so the question is that whether the benefit is higher than those costs. The only benefit we've, we're identifying here is 
confidence in the underlying results, um, which is not insignificant. I mean, you might, it could be that you become convinced, drug companies could become convinced, that this would be a much more effective way to test drugs because the confidence in what gets produced in those testing would be much higher, and therefore people's willingness to adopt or to pay for the drugs would be, uh, would be greater. Um, okay, other ideas about how testing, we could blind in the context of testing? No, yeah. Um, sometimes I think the issue comes up of who is going to be in charge of figuring out um, like who to give the money to. Because you want, you want experts, um, but what are they who, who are they affiliated with? Right, so if the DTA, you could have a different kind of corruption going on in the DTA. Um, so if the DTA uh, had a revolving door with drug companies, um, that would be one kind of improper influence. The DTA could have a revolving door with the testing companies. So the DTA, agencies, agents in the DTA were handing it off to testing companies that they knew um, uh, they would have some benefit for. So you'd want to make sure you had procedures that made sure that there wasn't ways for that kind of influence to also alter the, the veracity, the confidence you'd have in what the actual testing was. That's right. Yeah, so standard way to eliminate revolving door is to make it a career-busting length of time. So if it's three years, probably that's impossible for you to be worth it um, for that to do, to do that. You know, where, what are you going to do for three years? Um, maybe go raise a kid or something, I don't know. But um, uh, so, yeah, so some clear uh, length like that would make it so that you pick a, you pick a path. You either, you're either a regulator or you're, you're in the industry. And what would the, un what would the unintended consequence of that type of rule be? I mean, that sounds all good, but what would you expect would happen? What would the difference be between the people who work for the DTA and the people who work for the testing companies be? Just like Wall Street and the SEC. Yeah. Yeah, that, that ideally, but, but if you look at your career, yeah. Yeah, if you've got no revolving door, then what you've got is a class system. And these people will likely be in a better position to pay higher salaries than this entity will. Um, and so if that's true, then you create, you know, the dynamic that's alleged to exist with the SEC is the SEC is filled with lots of people who wouldn't get jobs on Wall Street. That's not true, actually. There are a lot of people in SEC who are amazing. but. Still, that's the perception, and part of the reason that's believable is there's such a radical difference in the pay. So the good from closing the revolving door is to avoid a certain kind of corruption. The bad is to create this separated environment that makes it harder for you to have great people in the regulatory position. Okay, so but blinding then is a general technique that we can think of as a way to remove the information that makes the corruption possible. If we can find a way to remove the chain of corrupting information, that's a solution. Um, uh, that, would be, that would be a solution to um, avoid that kind of corruption. And the final one I'm going to talk about just for a second before we're going to talk about it much more when we get to the examples we're going to play with is neutralization. So if you've got, if you've got institutional corruption, and you can't avoid corrupting influences on one direction, you might try to create conflicting influences that in some sense cancel each other out. So you, you know that you've got a magnet on one side of the compass, create an equal and opposite magnet on the other side of the compass, and now you have two magnets that are having conflicting, um, uh, having opposite effects that will cancel themselves out such that you're back to what the neutralizing, neutralized uh, answer would have been in the beginning. That's a little obscure right now, but when we talk about democracy, we'll see how exactly it works. Okay, so I'm going to take each of these remedies and we're going to apply it to the problem of democracy that I laid out in my two in the in the two lectures that we had about Congress. Um, um, okay, so first a little bit of brief review. What is the problem with the way our democracy works right now? I asked you to think about our problem in the way that one would have thought about the problem of the white primary in the old South. So the white primary in the Old South was a first stage and a two-stage process for selecting representatives 
which excluded a significant number of people from relevant participation in the first stage. If you weren't white, you couldn't vote in the Democratic primary. So people who were not white didn't have equal participation in the political process. That defined a certain kind of problem, the problem of unequal representative authority. And I said that against the background of that model, we, can, we have a way of understanding what the problem with this democracy is, the one we live in right now. The problem with this democracy is we also have a two-stage election. The first stage of the election is the money election, or the green primary, where people spend all their time raising money, the money they need to fund their campaigns. But they're raising that money not from you or from me, or certainly not from me, maybe from some of you, I don't know. But you know, the point is they're not raising a lot of money from um, people who are not incredibly wealthy. So the relevant funders, the people who have the power in the first of these two stages of elections, is not all of us. Um, and from the estimates that I've given you, I said that I think the number is about 150,000, which I said is the same number of people named Lester, which is why we live in Lesterland. And since that lecture, the Supreme Court has decided this case, which means we will have no more than about 35,000 people who are the relevant funders, which is about the same number of people who are named Sheldon. So whether we live in Lesterland or Sheldon City, the consequence of this dynamic for democracy is that we have a two-stage election that excludes the vast majority of people from the first stage. Um, and the consequences of that system of government are um, increasingly being um, demonstrated by statisticians and analysts. There's a great paper by Martin Guilens um, and Ben Page that's been in the press recently talking about um, how you can, you can demonstrate that it's only the very rich who have any influence over policy decisions, the middle class and the poor have no influence over the policy decisions. We saw that same conclusion drawn from earlier work by Guilens where he says, Americans with different income levels differ in their policy preferences. Actual policy outcomes strongly reflect the preferences of the most affluent but bear virtually no relationship to the preferences of the poor or middle income Americans. There's a vast discrepancy between the reality of the way our democracy works and how our democracy would work if, in fact, the representatives were following the will of the people alone. So we have this two-stage democracy where the first stage is handed over to a tiny, tiny fraction who happen to benefit pretty substantially in the policy game relative to where they would be benefiting if, in fact, their influence was weighted according to their population. This is what we could think of as the subsidy effect. They are subsidizing elections, and the effect of them subsidizing elections is to get something from it that they would otherwise wouldn't be getting or get more from it than we get because we're not relevant subsidizers. Okay, so if that's the problem, that's the corrupting influence, then let's think about how these remedies might work. Um, so first remedy here is disclosure. How would disclosure work or not work to deal with this problem of Lesterland or Sheldon City? First, what would disclosure be? <coughs> yeah. To some extent, but what is it that we do? Right, so we're supposed to have a system where we, we know exactly how much somebody is given above $200 to any candidate. In mo for the House of Representatives, we know that almost instantaneously in reporting periods. The United States Senate still turns over their reports on paper. So the, in the Senate offices, every reporting period, they take their database program and they print out a report and somebody carries it over to the FEC and they hire typists who sit there and type it into the FEC database. So it takes six weeks or more to get the information into the FEC database. So that means for the Senate races, we don't actually know in real time enough to make any real evaluation of the influence. But the idea of perfect disclosure would be we would know exactly who was giving what and we could evaluate a candidate on the basis of us knowing who was giving what. How would that help? Or, drop the how, would that help? 
So wait, you're saying you're not a multimillionaire. I mean, you don't have to admit that if you don't want, but. Okay, so assuming you're not a multimillionaire, right. You're not further incentivized to give. In fact, you might be disincentivized to give because you're seeing the only people who are giving or the people who are giving are giving in such large amounts that your $100 gift is not gonna be worth anything out there. So disclosure here has this counter unintended consequence. Exactly right, the unintended consequence is to make it less likely people would participate. And in fact, there is um, empirical work to demonstrate where you cap contributions and you keep the contributions low, contribution levels low, you increase the number of people contributing. That's both because candidates have to get more, but also because people are willing to donate more because they think that their donation has some marginal effect. But in a world where you see people giving, now after the McCutcheon decision, they can give up to $3.6 million every election cycle. Um, if you're not in that category of people who want to give $3.6 million, you're less likely to feel like you want to. So here's a classic example of disclosures having the opposite unintended effect. Any other thought about disclosure? Yeah. I think if um, disclosures made it clear what kind of influences um, would want to be exerted, then it would actually be You mean if it were not disclosed? If it were disclosed, it doesn't have to be, this is like a pro-business, I mean, this is like a pro-tobacco, um, pro-tobacco business, like, um, purpose. So that, so tell me how the disclosure then is not working. So, I, I think it would be working if it, if it were clear that funding is for a certain, or it could be for a certain purpose, but because Right, you could create the Americans for Tomorrow Tomorrow pack or something like that, right? Um, um, so, so there's a lack of d disclosure in that, but then the disclosure obviously could say, well, if we just knew where all the money was coming from, um, then we would have all the information we need to know what t we need to know in order to know how you were being influenced or not being influenced. But you were saying something at the beginning I thought was very interesting. You said it would create the incentive for somebody to act against the interests of the disclosure of the person who's made the contribution in order to convince the public that they're not being bought by that entity. Right. I think there would be a shaming effect if it could be made very clear that you have the potential to influence in a certain way. And so you would try not to be influenced in that way. But the danger in not being influenced that way is that next time around makes it harder to count on the contributions from these people. So the question is who's paying attention more, the funder or the public? But, but if in the second primary you need the public to get you into office, it doesn't matter if you have the like, first primary funding. Yeah, except if both, prim both candidates in the general election are equally tobacco candidates. Right? So they fund in the primaries in a certain way and they fund in the general election in a certain way. They want to be supporting both, party, both candidates in the general election in a particular way. Um, um, so, so the actual way it plays out, I agree, it can be complicated here, but let's add one other complication we mentioned, but let's just bring it to bear here. Um, remember the iceberg effect theory. So the iceberg effect theory said, um, it's equivalent for me to give you $10,000 as for me to give you $2,000 and to threaten to give your opponent $8,000. Okay, so how with full disclosure could you measure the influence I've had on you? Well, if I give you the $10,000, that's easy. You see it's a $10,000 influence. But if I've given you the $2,000, you have no way to know, nobody has any way to know that I've 
credibly threaten to give $8,000 to your opponent. Right? So the actual influence that you're manifesting is $10,000, but it looks like I'm getting that $10,000 influence for just paying $2,000. So the disclosure could never, in that context, reveal the full extent of influence, just couldn't by definition. Um, and so if you think disclosure is a remedy here, it's always going to be systematically incomplete for that, for, for that remedy. Even if it's giving you the information you need to know, it's not giving you enough of that information. Okay, so, that, so that's disclosure. So then number two, so bad timing, get over here. Um, ratings, how could ratings work in the context of politics? Build a rating system, Jennifer Miller, rating system. Building on your idea, actually. Be a nice rating system building on exactly your insight. Right, so there's a site, Open Secrets. Open Secrets makes it trivially easy for you to type in an interest and see what the relationship is between that interest and your congressperson. So you begin to make it easy to rate. You can imagine an independence rating. Um, building on what you just said, how predictable are your votes given the contributions you've received? And if, you're, if your votes are not predictable at all given the contributions you received, then you're fully independent. If your votes are fully predictable given the contributions you received, then you're not independent. And the interesting thing would be to see, see you know, what's the distribution of independence versus non-independence. So that's one way in which you could use the ratings to say, look, I'm not corrupt. They give me a 100% independence rating, which means money doesn't affect me. Um, and you know, it creates a market in people trying to demonstrate that they're not being affected. Now, of course, if in fact people are giving money for the purpose of influence, then you're either not going to be given money anymore or you're going to be finding a way to give money so that you're not manifesting influence. Um, um, and there are very interesting conventions that could develop in that context. So um, during, former, during the former Yugoslavia, um, there was a law against Serbians singing Serbian nationalist songs and Croats singing Cro 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 Croatian nationalist songs. Um, so at bars, they had this convention. The convention was a Serb would stand up and sing a Croat song, and a Croat would stand up and sing a Serb song, so that they wouldn't be violating the law, but they would be achieving what they're trying to achieve. So you can imagine the same game happening in contributions. Like, I know I need to get you on tobacco, but I know you're not going to vote with me on tobacco, so I'll match my contribution over here with a contribution that goes for something you will, like you, you, you support global warming legislation. So a global warming contribution will come into you, tobacco contribution will come into you, but it'll have the regulatory effect that I want it to have. It'll just be not transparent. Um, so disclosure ratings could make it possible to track people down better who are independent, but it also makes it, uh, facilitates a strong incentive to find ways to subvert the transparency regime. Okay, defense. Um, so what would a defense technique be? Well, again, taking this idea, we send congressmen to school to teach them how to resist the influence of your contributors, right? So, um, you know, you got contribution from the oil company. So every morning you have to wake up and say, I hate oil, I hate oil, I hate oil. Like, what are the exercises you could go through to make it so that the influences are counterproductive. So you're building your defenses um, um, or you know, exposing yourself to these corrupting germs and learning how to build the resistance you need. Um, not a very promising response. Okay, let's move on quick. Um, okay, blinding is the really interesting one here. Um, it's a great book by Ackerman and Ayers, <coughs> which creates the idea of the anonymous donation booth. We talked about this briefly. The intuition behind the anonymous donation booth is this. Um, uh, the intuition, what, what drives the whole idea is the development of anonymous voting. I told you an, voting in America originally was not anonymous. You'd walk into a room, raise your hand, say, I vote for candidate X. What that did was facilitate a market in voting because it was easy to verify that you voted for the person you promised to vote for. 
So for most of the 19th century, huge chunks of votes were bought, literally just bought and paid for. And when they eliminated the opportunity by creating anonymous voting, huge drop off in voter participation because nobody was interested in voting if they were not going to be paid to vote. Okay, so, um, and why did anonymous voting drive up, drive, drive away um, um, people being willing to sell their votes? Because you couldn't verify anymore that somebody had actually delivered on the contract. They could say, look, I promise if you give me $5, I will vote for candidate X. But if you're the sort of person who would sell your vote to one person, you're the sort of person who would sell your vote to two people. So there's no way for you to know that the person would deliver on that promise, and therefore the value of that promise would be worth nothing. So Ackerman and Ayers apply the same thing to donations. They say if the real problem to contributions in our political system is the fear of an implicit quid pro quo, you could destroy that by making it impossible for somebody to know who gave them the money. And if you made it impossible for them to know who gave them the money, then they can't be in a position to actually reward anybody because they don't know who they should be rewarding. So imagine a donation, donation booth where you're walking in and say, I'm going to give Elizabeth Warren $10,000. The donation booth puts it into a pot, maybe controlled by the FEC. And then over a period of time, the pot spits out in random amounts, in random time periods, the amount that it's collected to the bank account of Elizabeth Warren. So you call up Elizabeth Warren and say, hey, uh, Senator, I just delivered $10,000 to your bank account. She has no way to look at the receipts of her bank account to see whether that's true. Because all she sees is on Saturday, $2,000 came in. On Monday, $15,000 came in. On Wednesday, another $25,000 came in. So there's no relationship between what you say and what she sees. And therefore, you could be lying and she wouldn't be tricked. So therefore, she's not going to reward you. Be well, she wouldn't reward you anyway, because it's Elizabeth Warren we're talking about here. But, um, but she wouldn't reward you, because there's no way she could have any confidence in your contribution. OK, what's the problem with that idea? Yeah. So well, one thing I, I don't know if this is a problem you're thinking of, but one thing I'm thinking of is that like, campaigns need to be more abundant at different points in the campaign, for example. So like for the last two weeks, we probably need Right, so if you allow people to give unlimited amounts and over a short period of time, you know, if I gave $10 billion to Elizabeth Warren and all of a sudden, you know, billions of dollars were filing, so it would be pretty credible that I would say, yeah, I'm the guy who gave the $10 billion that eventually ended up in your account. But if you kept it to a number like $10,000 as the max or $50,000 as the max, and, you were, and there were a bunch of people giving, the only point is you could, you could divide it up so it's random enough that nobody could really be confident. Right? And that's, the, that's the, the, the way this works. Now, there's a first response to this. Yeah? Surely the science is the reason why people get money is to uh, influence. So if you're taking away the ability to uh, influence, surely no one who's going to pay you for it for the time. Yeah, so um, an example which I talk about in my book, I was going to mention here, but let me mention it now. In Florida, they adopted this model for judges. So you were not allowed to tell. The judges weren't allowed to know who contributed to their campaigns. The result was nobody gave to any judges. There was zero campaign contributions. <laughs> because why would you give if you're not going to be known? Because the only purpose of giving is giving influence. And so therefore, this was bringing out pretty clearly the purpose of the contributions was influence buying. And this eliminated the influence buying. So anonymous donation booths on their own, blinding on their own, might actually be too good, too effective, in the sense that they would dry up the willingness to contribute. Um, um, so, that, so that's why they also say we need public funding as part of their solution. Um, uh, but let's think about the mechanics here to make sure we're all clear about one particular problem. Yeah. Yeah, which is not addressed by this. You could Maybe it would drive all the influence to that. Um, that's true. Um, let's just make sure, though, there's one point about this you might, you might be thinking to yourself. So I say I gave you $10,000, and you have no way to know. Well, what if you bring Elizabeth Warren into the vote do anonymous donation booth? And you say, here, look, watch me push the numbers. 
$10,000, Elizabeth Warren, enter. Um, now she knows. Except that's why they add this other feature to the way this thing works, which is you have 24 hours to withdraw any contribution. So you could bring her into the booth. You could type the numbers, $10,000. You could hit return. She says, thank you for the contribution. She leaves. Then you could say, give me my money back. And you take your money back. So therefore, now sh you don't have to pay $10,000. But she knows you're the sort of person who, because you're willing to show her directly that you've given $10,000, or a slimy sort to begin with, so you're likely to want to withdraw your money after you've given it. So there's very little reason for her to have any reason to give you any benefit, because you're probably not going to go through with the contribution. Yeah. What if she just like, watched the money, the, the donation booth for the next 24 hours, and you didn't know? If she locked it? No, no, no. Like, yeah. But what if the donation booth is just a metaphor here, right? <laughs> like I'm talking about any computer anywhere. So you're right. If you kind of lock the guy in a room and you said, we're holding you hostage for 24 hours, we'll give you lots of free food and drink, but that's it. You're, then that would be an effective way to take care of this problem, right? Um, but you might have to regulate around that. Um, OK, but notice this is a total blinding solution. Um, I mentioned the judge's thing in Florida. In the actual recommended the code of judicial conduct, there's also this rule that says you should be blinding the contributors to the judge unless there's some uh, explicit reason why they have to know. But this technique is pretty obvious way to apply this theory of blinding to make sure that whatever influence there is, it's not going to be influence of quid pro quo in the context of campaign contributions. And finally, the idea of neutralization. This is where neutralization begins to make sense. Um, OK, so um, if the problem with the way we fund elections is that we've concentrated all the influence, the solution to that is to spread out the influence. So in my book, I talk about something called the Grant and Franklin Project. Grant and Franklin Project says everybody gives at least $50 uh, in taxes to the federal government, whether it's income tax or social security tax or cigarette tax or something, we all send at least $50 to Washington, to the Treasury building right there. Um, so that first $50, we can imagine, gets rebated in the form of a democracy voucher, which candidates can get if they fund their campaigns with vouchers plus contributions limited to $100 per citizen. So that's $50 voucher, grant, $100 contributions, Franklin. And if you don't allocate your voucher, then the voucher money gets split based on your party registration to either the Republicans or the Democrats. Or if you want, you can just send it back to the Treasury. So $50 a voter turns out to be $7 billion, which is a lot of money. Um, turns out to be about three times the amount of money spent in the last congressional election. Um, so it's real money, but it's neutralized money in the sense that it's money coming from anybody. So the corrupting influence gets cancels itself out, right? So to the extent there's influence, it's influence that is perfectly reflective of the influence of the voters generally. And that means, therefore, it's not exclusive to some green primary party. It's everybody who gets to participate in it. So that's a technique to reduce the corrupting influence by spreading out the influence and undermining any narrow thing. One last question, and then we'll so break. That was, that's not your vote. You your vote. Right. This is a money vote, and then there's a voting vote. Right, this is the money vote. That's what we're talking about. Okay, that's remedies class one. Remedies class two, Thursday. Thanks.